Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to week 28 of One More Verse. I am here joined by my esteemed colleague, Ward Hodges. You'll notice absent from the panel is the man who evidently took a sabbatical and told no one. If anyone wants to search for him on the Twitter verse and perhaps call him out for missing so many weeks, he's like a bad congregant who has fallen off the wagon. You could probably find him in the mountains somewhere. Tweet at him, at Bob Agan, and tell him, hey, where are you? And especially you, Frocahannes, if you want to tell him, you should definitely reach out to him and just find out. Bob, I would say we miss you, but I don't know that that adequately sums up exactly what we're feeling. But enough of that. We're not angry. We're not bitter. We're just happy to be here. So without further ado, Ward Hodges, good evening to you, sir. How are you, my friend? We're doing well. How is uh, How are things there in the ward? Oh, oh. just uh, living the dream, baby. Living the dream. Waiting on Jesus to come back. That kind of thing. Yes, well, uh, tell me, uh, how's the weather down there just now? Right as rain, right as rain. Perfect, perfect, uh, beautiful 78 degrees. Wow. I was in Minnesota, by the way, for my new friends in Minnesota that promised you would be joining us on the broadcast. I hope that you made it. And if so, hey, good to see you, especially you, Derek. I hope that you're watching because we're going to talk about this. Uh, but uh, the weather there was not Orlando-like. Uh, it was freezing sleet, and they sent me a video of snow today. So I, I, I don't know that I want to go to Minnesota, even in April. I may have to push it to May next year. Well, you're wise to do so. So, Ward, uh, we missed you last week. Uh, tell us about where you were last week. I was at a little conference called the Gospel Coalition here in Orlando, John, and uh, 6,000 pastors from 50 different countries in every state in the union, and uh, we had a wonderful time worshiping together and learning together and and uh, trying to figure out Jesus together, and it was really good. That's good. I would encourage you guys. You're looking for some good resources. There's some great, great blogs you can follow, some videos there, so you can check that out. Well, we're glad that you're back with us. I'm excited about this week. We have we are moving into the beginning of the church, so I'm ready for us to get into it. So let's pray, and we'll jump in. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for your grace toward us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your grace toward us even in the scripture. Thank you uh, Lord, that you have not left us to figure this out, but that you've revealed yourself clearly. So I pray now, uh, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Help us that we might understand the scripture. Help us not just to hear, but to be doers also. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So we jumped in this week. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for us. We're in the book of Acts. And if you um, were paying attention to your reading there, you'll notice that this is kind of the companion edition to the Gospel of Luke. And Luke continues telling the story where the Gospel of Luke is basically the story of the life and ministry of Jesus. We pick up in Acts, and this is after Christ has um, gone through the Passion. He has suffered. He has died. But three days later, he is gloriously resurrected to life. And this it keeps us up to speed with what happened after that. And so in Acts chapter one, I love the fact that um, the disciples are having to do something that none of us like to do, and that's wait. And they're waiting for God, the Holy Spirit to come, because when he comes, they're going to receive power and be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Now, I, I would just remind you that waiting for them was as difficult as waiting is for us, and they are definitely still feel the heat from the Jewish authorities uh, and all that has transpired there. But as they are there, uh, they wait, and then we have this incredible thing that happens in Acts chapter 2. The Bible tells us that as they're in the place, that there's the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and in that, the Holy Spirit comes during this time called Pentecost. And as the Holy Spirit comes, it manifests God's presence in what is described best as tongues of fire. And they begin to uh, boldly proclaim the gospel. And as Ward pointed out last week, one of my favorite things about that is you've got this guy, Peter, who has made a spectacular mess of things as of recently, whether it be in his having to be publicly reinstated on the seashore or whether it was his denial and catching eyes with Christ, recognizing that his 
bravado for following Jesus unto death didn't pan out, or if it was his violent tendency to grab a sword and go after the ear of Malchus. Uh, Peter had failed spectacularly, but now suddenly with the coming of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that happens is now this Peter who God has had to reveal that Jesus is even the Christ suddenly is an expert in Older Testament prophecy and, and goes on a, a long explanation of Joel's prophecy and of a prophecy from David. And so you have this incredible thing that takes place as the spirit comes and Peter gives the sermon and everyone, uh, they just have a question. What do we do now? Uh, we hear, uh, so what do we do? And Peter says, well, you repent. Remember that repentance is much more than just feeling sorry, but you repent and he calls them to obedience and baptism. Uh, and so, um, there are thousands added to the church in a single day by a sermon from a guy who had just recently failed very spectacularly. And so we have um, the development of the church. The officials are not happy about this. There's all kinds of uproar going on. There's uh, persecution that starts to happen. They're asking questions. Peter and John are headed to the temple and there's this guy there who's begging and he just wants some money. And Peter's going, well, I don't have any of that, but here's what I have. And um, you see this healing take place and you have the one man mosh pit as he just runs around jumping up and down and speaking of God's goodness and his praise and everybody is just trying to figure out what in the world is going on. And so we're introduced to uh, uh, this guy um, named Barnabas. So I hope that you didn't miss the introduction to Barnabas there in Acts chapter four, because this is an incredible foundation that's being laid as to what happens now. We've been through the gospels. We know the life and the ministry of Jesus. So now what is going to happen? And so we have this um, brilliant thing that God births the church. He's already promised it. And now the church is birthed and we have it coming in power with great wonders and signs and conversion as people repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved. They obey in baptism and they give themselves to joining together in communities and to the apostles teaching and to prayer and um, and, and they're generous toward others. And so it's this wonderful, wonderful time. So I, I want us to talk a little bit as we open up in this first section about the fact that none of this was on accident. There are no such things as accidents, only providence. And so I want us to talk about something that Peter said, that this happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, because this was a strategic time, a ward. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, the idea that um, that God is a reactionary God is totally wrong. The old little, you know, funny saying, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God, is very true. Um, I don't, I, I have heard it said that while we look at time in a line, like a timeline, God looks at time in a circle, as if it's already all done. And I don't, I don't know exactly how true that is, but what I do know is that God knows the end from the beginning and he sees yesterday as we see, to, as uh, he sees tomorrow as we see yesterday. <clears throat> and so um, God doesn't react to anything. Everything has been planned, everything. And so he's been planning this from the very beginning of time prior to the beginning of the universe. And so, yes, it's a, um, an exciting time. It's a Galatians 4, 4 kind of time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And all this is all part of God's redemptive plan in history. And the reason why that helps me is because God sees uh, Wednesday like I saw Monday. And so it's not any big deal to him and everything has been all planned out by him. It's always been that way. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, the comforting thing in that is that th there's nothing that has taken God by surprise. And even as we move, have just moved from the death burial uh, into the resurrection, this has always been God's plan. And you get that what people call the proto evangel there in Genesis three, that God has already said that well, reference to what you just said in Genesis in, in Galatians four, that from Genesis three to Galatians four, this has always been God's plan. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world that in the love of the father, son and spirit, the grace 
uh, would be on full display and glory uh, would be um, unrivaled in the fact that God's grace, even in creation, that this has always been his plan. But I, I just love the fact that here's a guy who so many people, we, I just identify with Peter. He's a guy who talks first and he thinks later. Uh, he's a guy who's just, I mean, he's absolutely blown it. I mean, this is the guy who, who just, he's not getting anything. He, we, I mean, you start just, just in the last few hours of Jesus's life, whether it's, you know, they're at the table, Jesus starts washing feet. Peter's like, no way, you're not washing mine. Jesus is like, well, then you have no part. He goes, okay, well, let's talk about a bath. And Jesus is like, you don't get it at all. Come pray with me. He falls asleep. Pray with me. Falls asleep. They show up there. He hacks off a guy's ear. He denies. He curses. He has to be reinstated. I mean, this is a guy. And suddenly, as the Holy Spirit comes upon him, he, he gives this brilliant sermon and, and, and that line that there is a definite plan according to the foreknowledge of God. That, that gives me comfort. I, I know that the, it may feel like sometimes things are coming off the track, but uh, there, you know, but God rules and reigns and nothing happens outside the scope of his dominion or knowledge. Yeah. God's ways are not our ways. And this is the guy, the guy that continually messes up. This is the guy that God puts in charge of the apostles, you know, and you're like, really, this is not exactly who I would pick. Um, and I think it goes back to that thing that we've seen all the way through as we walk through the old Testament narrative that God always picks people that nobody else would pick to do the big things. And there's a reason why he does that. And the reason why is because he wants to get the glory for it and not a person's own ability get the glory. And so um, with Peter, the guy that you would least expect, even of the 12, to be the guy to stand up and preach from the minor prophets he's not the guy get somebody who's smart and get somebody who's no, not him, not the guy who keeps screwing up. And God says, watch what I do with this guy. I'm going to make it. And by the way, I don't mean to, uh, uh, you know, tell the end of the story, but we're going to come back again to him screwing up again. Even tonight, we're going to talk about him screwing up again. And yet God goes, no problem because I enjoy using people who are screw ups and which gives me hope. Yeah, and I love the fact too. Scripture doesn't hide the fact that people just fail miserably. But scripture doesn't hide the fact that I mean, you know, when you start walking through the scripture outside of Christ, that we don't hide the vices of people and the poor decisions and the broken relationships. The so scripture it just lays it out there, and that makes those trophies of grace more shiny, if you will. I know it's not a great analogy, but it just it does give me hope because. There's so many places where I see my inadequacy and I have doubts about my abilities and things like that. And I love the fact that scripture is just honest. And, and, and we've got, and so here's Peter. And you see the fact that this is a plan and, and you see just all these strategic things happen. I mean, it's a time of Pentecost. Now, for us, it's kind of lost on us, but we, We've had um, Passover. Jesus celebrates the Passover meal. So Pentecost, that Penta thing, it's 50 days, and, and, and they're in there. And this is the celebration of first fruits, which is brilliant because Jesus is the first fruits of a new kind of body and existence. And so it's this time that for Jerusalem is so strategic because the city is swollen with people from all over the world. If you look through that list, I mean, you know, they're, they're talking about Phrygia, Pamphylia, Libya, because you've got Cyrene there. You remember Simon of Cyrene? I mean, it's Arabs. It, there, there's people from all over. The city is swollen with the nations. The city, you know, there, there's just people from all over. And so when Peter delivers this, I mean, already you talk about the witness spreading quickly. Uh, to everyone who goes home, I mean, it's it's already spreading. And so you see that definite plan. But let's talk just a little bit about the, uh, the whole tongues thing. I, I think for a lot of people, they get a little more caught up in kind of the idea that it's tongues than they do um, connecting this into the whole picture of God. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things important for us to remember is you go to Older Testament, God's presence uh, was pillar of day. Uh, I mean, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. So you have that fire, you know, with Moses, it's the burning bush. If it's Elijah, it's fire 
falling over and over. The, the idea of this fire is a manifestation of God's presence. And when we get to tongues, the scripture is not talking about some, you know, unintelligible utterance that nobody understands. These guys are looking around going, it's a bunch of Galileans. They're not supposed to be able to speak my language. And yet I hear exactly the works of God and what Peter is saying. So I think sometimes we, we get a little confused and maybe we could put too much emphasis on the fact that it's tongues of fire rather than the fact that it's fire that manifests God's presence. And we're not hearing in unintelligible things. We're hearing in language. No, you and I are communicating right now through a device that sends this message all over the world and anybody can get it really easy. Well, this wasn't around 2000 years ago, right? What was around 2000 years ago was Pentecost. When, when people with all different languages came into one spot and I don't know, I don't, maybe I don't know my history well enough, but I don't know of any other event in any other culture where all people from all the different languages came together into one place except here in Jerusalem, uh, you know, and so here they all are. And God says, I'm going to use this as a tool, if you will, uh, the method I'm going to choose to spread my gospel all over the world. And so he uses these languages, which it's clear in this case, that's exactly what's happening uh, um, to accomplish his goal. And the idea of them being in a room and the whole room shaking and the wind coming in, and it's a symbol of God saying, listen, folks, uh, when I show up, remember in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20, when he showed up, the whole ground shook. The whole mountain was covered in smoke. It was kind of a scary thing. And I think this is the same kind of thing that's going on here, that when God's presence happens, big things happen, and we ought to sit up and take notice. Yeah, I think, too, you know, as we moved on uh, past Pentecost, which uh, an incredible event for us to treasure, that the coming of the Holy Spirit, and remember we talked about it's God, the Holy Spirit. Um, we move into, you know, there's a beautiful passage there about they had all things in common and they devoted themselves, the apostle teaching, the prayer, the breaking of bread, all, all these sorts of things. And then by the time we, we get to Wednesday's readings, uh, things are changing a bit because as people are selling property and bringing to those who have need, uh, we're introduced to some hypocrisy and we're introduced to somebody named Ananias and Sapphira who um, do a very good thing in selling their property and completely within their rights, they decide, hey, we're, we're going to give some of the proceeds, but we're not going to give all the proceeds and, but to save face, we want everybody to think that we're doing what they're doing. And so we'll just tell them that we're, we're given everything and we'll keep some for ourselves. And so you have this incredible thing. I, you know, I wonder what it must've been like, because it talks about the fear that comes over everybody as you have a husband and wife, both fall dead uh, from these impure motives, the lying, the hypocrisy and those sorts of things. And so you start to move through and you're seeing these signs and wonders. And, and it's important for you guys to remember when you see signs and wonders, signs and wonders are not the thing that create faith. Signs and wonders are the thing that authenticate um, the ones who are acting as part of God's agency to verify, hey, they have my authority uh, to do this. And so all of these things are happening and, and they're bringing um, you know, they bring in Peter and John and they're like, what's going on here? What are y'all doing? And, and, you know, they, they charge them strictly. Don't do this. Uh, I, I love the fact that they get called idiots. They look at them and they're uneducated men, uh, uh, and they're, and, and, and they're just, they're getting all fired up. They, they very well want to kill them. And we're not the intervention of someone in the council going, no, listen, 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 listen. We, if it's not from God, it'll fail and given a little bit of history lesson there. But if it is from God, we don't want to be on in that place. And so we, we walk through there. Um, they count themselves. Uh, they, they find joy in the fact that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. So there's not this idea that, oh, I, I should just be comfortable. And if I'm persecuted, I go and pout. They, they celebrated with joy that they were counted worthy 
um, to suffer. And so you move on and uh, we find out that there's some disagreement that happens in the distribution of food between these Gre Grecian widows and um, these Hebraic widows and, and, and this disagreement uh, gets, you know, pretty rowdy evidently. And they uh, say, listen, it's not good for us to attend to this kind of thing. So we're, uh, we need to set apart these men. They pray, they identify those men, they lay hands on them uh, and they establish this. And one of those in particular, a guy named Stephen, um, this deacon, not only was his life exemplary for what it looked like to follow Jesus, but his reasoning was incredible. And he's having conversations with the Jewish people and they can't rival his wisdom. They, they're not matching because he too, just like Peter is having things come to remembrance. He's, he's been given uh, unction for clear utterance of God's truth. And so you see that as this thing is going, as it's growing, that things are transforming. And so uh, it, it's an incredible picture to see how it works out. But for, um, for Stephen, as we read through, the Bible tells us that Stephen becomes a martyr, that Stephen, uh, that they just lose it. When the gospel is presented clearly, they do not respond in a way that is even open to listening, but they drive him out. And what an incredible thing for him to be able to, to see his king at the right hand and to be able to say, forgive them, uh, even as he, and I love the way that the scripture talks about this, even as he falls asleep. And so we have that, we have the gospel spreading into Samaria with Philip. Uh, you know, we, we have this incredible picture of the guys going in and they're performing signs and wonders. And so there's this magician that wants to buy some of that power because uh, everybody is very interested in, in what's going on. Everybody wants to be a part, but I, I want us to camp out and, and spend a little bit of time talking about the fact that sometimes we like to romanticize the whole concept of church. We like to, you know, we, we want to get there when we park at X 242 and, and following, especially through 46 there, we just kind of want to park and we think, well, that's just the way it always was. But if you read, the church has always had problems. The church has always suffered persecution. This is not something that has only happened in the last century. This is something that's been going on from the very beginning. So let's talk about the truth that the church has always had some difficulties, challenges. Yeah. So there's, there's, uh, there's two that come off the top of my head. There's two constants that are the same in, uh, in 2015 as it was in the year uh, 30 or whenever we're talking about here, 40, let's call it. All right. Uh, the two constants are, is that then as in now, churches are filled with um, what I like to call people and people are, are sinful. Um, and so there's, there's the problem that if you're, uh, if you're just uh, an idiot, when God saves you, you don't stop being an idiot. You're just a saved idiot. And so you, you uh, run into that even in Acts with the whole disagreements over who's getting fed when and how much they're getting and yada, yada, yada. And it's just a big mess. And the same kind of thing goes on today with our stinking deacon boards or our elders that are just, you know, filled with people complaining about everything because it's the same now as it was then. We're no better now. And I don't think we're any worse than they were then. I think people are people. The second constant is not only are churches still filled with people, but the evil one is still trying to to um, get rid of us. And he was trying to get rid of us then, and he's trying to get rid of us now. I mean, yesterday, ISIS killed 30 Christians by taking them to the sea and chopping their head off. That happened yesterday. And uh, the stuff that's happening in Kenya and in Africa with the whole Boko, uh, whoever they are, Boko Haram. Haram, that's the word I'm trying to get to. Yeah, the, it, you know, it's just continual. And, it, and, and even in a place like America where there's no violent persecution, it's coming. Uh, and so uh, that's all the same as it was then. And nothing has changed with regard to either of those things. Yeah, so uh, so what you're saying is when people who are sinful and make mistakes get together, 
sometimes they don't get along. Is that what you're saying, Lord? Yeah, what you get is when you have people who are sinful and don't get along, when they get together, you have a group of people who are sinful and don't get along. And so things things tend to get uh, worse. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would say a couple of things to kind of keep in mind for those of you who are reading through there. The church has always had struggles. The church has always faced challenges. They had an angry business meeting right away. All of this distribution where people were selling their property and so they're stocking the food pantry and feeding those who are in need. Well, the people who are in need, a bunch of little old ladies get angry about who's getting more and who's getting first and what's going on here. So this, you know, this body that has cash coming in and they're flush with cash and they're trying to do good works. There's struggles even in that. We've got hypocrisy happening. Financial um, challenges come because not too far removed from here, not only is there going to be the dispersion of Christians from Jerusalem, but later the church is going to have to take up some offerings and send it back to the ones in Jerusalem because they are destitute and suffering. And so I, I didn't put this in the notes. I'm going to freestyle a little bit more. But one of the things I think that some people can kind of, uh, maybe not look fully enough at is that whole idea of, okay, well, they sold everything they had. Is this prescriptive or is it descriptive? In other words, am I just supposed to sell every single thing that I have and give it all away? And I don't believe that the answer is yes. I think this is descriptive rather than prescriptive. And I think at the point that it, um, you, you're not acting in great wisdom as far as if it hurts um, your ability to serve and do things in the future. Um, some of those things, I think we, if we're not careful, we'll try to turn this into basically a, a socialism experiment and we'll take it that everybody's supposed to do that. No, as Christians, we are supposed to have generous and give with glad hearts. Um, but this is descriptive rather than prescriptive. And, and the church, when it comes down to it though, even right in the heels of this, we, we have somebody being martyred. We, we, we have, um, the need to raise up a whole nother leadership group within there called deacons so that they can serve and help in this. Um, th there's, there's all these challenges. And so I want to touch on one more thing before we get away from this. And it, and it's this, we, we live, um, especially because of our affluence here in America, we live in a place where a lot of people approach church from a consumeristic mindset and the idea is that the church exists for my entertainment. And if I'm not entertained in a way that I want to be entertained, or if I don't think the entertainment value is very good, then we have a lot of people that'll just go church shopping. That'll just leave. So let's talk a little bit more just about what it means to be a part of a body and a family. Well, uh, you've heard me say this a thousand times. Um, write it down tweet it, whatever you need to do. God does not exist for my benefit. Uh, I exist for his benefit. And thus, ergo, <laughs> his church does not exist for my benefit either. I exist for his church. And he's the one that said it was his church. And he's the one that said that he would build his church. And thus, if I am a part of his church, it's by God's grace that I'm a part of his church. And I need to take my complaints and felt needs and check them at the door when I walk in because I'm here to serve the one true God and not have him serve me. Uh, that's a little preachy, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm talking as a pastor here a little bit, so I have to, I have to rein myself in. But nonetheless, uh, we're not market driven. We shouldn't be market driven. And we should not do things based upon um, what we believe will grow a crowd. There's a difference between building a church and building a crowd. You can tweak that too if you want, because there's a lot of people who have built big crowds under the name of a church, and it's not a church. It's entirely something different. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I is so very concerning for me is the fact that some we're built in this society where if, relationships don't benefit us in the way that we think they should. Doesn't even have to be a real thing. It can just be a felt thing. But if they, if we don't feel like relationships benefit us, 
we've gotten to the place where we use what I'll call relational currency. So as long as I feel like you're meeting my needs and you're doing what I want you to do, and this relationship is beneficial for me, then I'll stay in it. But the moment that you don't do what I think you ought to do, or you're not um, meeting expectations, whether real, uncommunicated, communicated, or otherwise, then I'm just going to discard the relationship. That is not at all what the scripture talks about when it describes followers of Jesus. We're, we're supposed to be people that give our lives away for the sake of the gospel. We're supposed to humble ourselves and be obedient and serve. Jesus showed us the example. He came to a rebellious people that he served that were ungrateful, that didn't get it. And so for us, a lot of times in church, rather than just hanging in faithfulness, loyalty, long suffering, patient waiting and enduring, we just go, well, you know what? I'm out. And I, I just think we need to have those discussions as a church. Let's talk about our dearest friend, Peter, again, right? So Mr. Screwup. And Jesus goes to Mr. Screwup, let me, let me wash your feet to Mr. Screwup. And so, you know, let me serve you in the most demeaning way known to man. Let me sit down and wash your dirty, filthy, stinking feet, right? And so then Paul comes along and he tells us, all right, fellas, uh, you want to serve Christ? Then let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who decided to serve us by leaving everything and coming to nothing. And so if we're going to be part of his body, you know, his mind is in his body. And so let this mind be in the body of Christ, which is the church and serve. Yeah. So I would say um, a couple of things you need to, I hope that you pick up from more than I now is this. If you belong to a local body, a local church, and by the way, you should, I should, uh, by qualifying that if, I want you to know that the scripture says that's what you're supposed to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you should not forsake the assembling of yourselves. You're, you're a part of the body. You're a part of the family at large, but you, you need a local zip code, a place that you're plugged in. So if you're a part of that local body, you should be serving in some capacity. I don't know what that looks like for you. I, I don't know how that challenges you. And and I want you to know there's there's always something that you can do. There's always a place that you can serve. So the idea that I stroll in five minutes before the service starts, I complain about the coffee and donuts and how they didn't have my favorite kind. The air was too hot. The music was too loud. The sermon was too long. I didn't like this. I wish we had done this. And then you slide out and then that is not at all what the Bible describes as the called out ones, the gathering of the body of Christ. So if you're in a church, you need to find a place to serve. You, you should be plugged in. You should be serving. You should be active. The other thing that I would encourage you is there are times when you have to leave a church. Sometimes there's natural transitions, whether graduation or you move or whatever. There are other reasons to leave a church if they are heretical and they teach things contrary to scripture. But what I'm telling you is that I think for us, we are too quick because we're so programmed that this is about us. And we're so much that consumer mindset that we just abandon and we leave and we're not plugged in and we're not serving and we're just doing the Monday morning quarterback. Well, this is what's wrong. And I think we should do this. And if we had drums, we'd probably reach more young people or if we had this style. So my, my exhortation to you is this, the church has always had problems. Let's not over romanticize what happened in the book of Acts. There was a beautiful few days. There was a beautiful few weeks. It didn't last long. And then, and then they faced those challenges. Be in your body, serve in that body, in that family, love them, give your lives away so that others uh, may see what it looks like to follow Jesus. And the other thing that Ward touched on, and I, and I don't want to leave this, um, is the church has always suffered persecution. So don't be surprised. Uh, it, it's an odd thing that we haven't suffered any more persecution. Um, we're, we are, this is an unusual thing for us. And rather than appreciate it, everybody's not going to agree with you. And there are people who are giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. So I would encourage you one, 
pray for our brothers and sisters that are persecuted. And two, don't get your feelings hurt when everybody doesn't agree with you and suffer well and, and, and follow well, even during hardship. You got any other thoughts on that word? Cause I'm thinking we're about to preach here, brother. You summed it up. Good, man. Good. Well, we moved on. And in and, and the last phase of what we were reading through there was, I, I just, this is one of my favorite parts of this. Cause you know, in, in talking about persecution, we get introduced to a terrorist. Um, this particular terrorist, uh, uh, had already participated in the taking of a Christian's life. The Bible says there was a young ruler there when uh, Stephen's life was taken away from him by people throwing rocks until he died. This young man's name was Saul. He was very gifted. Uh, he was very charismatic. He was brilliant. Uh, he had a lot of clout. And so this terrorist put together a plan to go, to go throughout the synagogues to find people that belong to the way that were followers of Jesus to take their lives, to take them to public spectacle of prison. Um, you can read some of this because I'll just remind you the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. And so not only is this Acts chapter nine, a great thing where, where Luke kind of gives us an understanding, but go over to Acts chapter 26, where Paul gives his own testimony about what that looked like. But we're introduced to this guy named Saul, this terrorist. And while he is on the way to Damascus, uh, he's headed there and this terrorist encounters Jesus and it changed everything. And this guy who comes with all of the, you know, the temple guard and all the pomp and circumstance that you can imagine he's coming into town and he's going to, you know, there's a new sheriff. He's cleaning it out. There's not going to be any of these heretics that are following the way and following Jesus. I know what the, the, the Bible has to say. I want people to read it, know it. So I'm going to go in here. I'll just get rid of anybody who doesn't do that. And he has an encounter with the living God. And the a couple of details that I always think are incredible in this is that the Bible says that it was about midday. And this is Paul's testimony, not in Acts 9 where we read, but it was about midday. And there was a light that was so bright it outshone the sun there in the Middle East. And it knocked him to the ground, the weight of the manifestation of God's glory. And a voice said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so this proud man now comes led by the hand because he cannot see. And he finds himself there, no food, no water. He's in fasting and praying, trying to figure out. He sees a vision of someone named Ananias who comes, who prays for him. Ananias has some serious questions. He wants to get straight with the Lord if God's aware of what this guy's been doing. And we see in this that there's some incredible things that are starting to take place. There is God is helping these um, apostles to understand what it means to go to the uttermost part. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, they can all kind of get their arms around that. And there's a bit of connection there historically, especially Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They don't like them at all. But then the idea of Gentiles and the uttermost is just way outside their scope of um, natural inclination for sure. And so God is steadily intervening. And he says that I'm going to show this guy, Saul, how much he will suffer for my name's sake. He will go to Jews, to Kings, to Gentiles, and he is going to do something that I have said is going to happen all along through your offspring, Abraham, every nation is going to be blessed, not just the nation of Israel, every nation. And so you have this moment where Paul encounters, he obeys immediately. He's baptized. He takes some food and then he just starts preaching Jesus. He shows up in the synagogues where he was going to go and take people as prisoner. And instead he starts preaching Christ risen from the dead. So I, I want us to talk a little bit about how when we encounter um, the living God, uh, what that looks like and how that changes us and where some of those struggles may be. Okay. So the context is very important to me. Um, I try to remember that um, Saul slash Paul did not come to Christ because he was uh, seeker sensitive. He was not um, he was not looking for Jesus. Um, when he woke up that morning over his Cheerios, he did not say, "I'm going to go investigate Jesus." What happened in this particular case is Jesus was seeking for Paul. And he did something uh, dramatic. When Jesus says, I came to seek and to save that who was lost, there was nobody more lost than Saul was. 
And so when, when Jesus, you know, I often say God wanted Saul saved so bad, he sent Jesus to witness to him. And so Jesus actually shows up, knocks him off the horse, and by noon that day, he's a believer. And you just go, how in the world, you know, what happened between breakfast and lunch, you know? <laughs> and, and what happened was God showed up. And so um, we have to try to get in our mind that what we started tonight with, which is that God has got a plan, and he's always had a plan. And from Genesis 3.15 that you brought up all the way through, we see that God has been working his plan. And Paul, it turns out, was a major part of God's plan. And so God does a work to get to Paul. All right, so how does that help me? That helps me because I, when I go to work in the morning or go to school or run errands or whatever I have to do tomorrow, I need to realize that God's orchestrating things for his plan and that God's got this and there's a sense of uh, there's a sense of rest when we can get our minds wrapped around that that when things happen eh, God's not taken off guard and he's got it all he's got it yeah and I think one of the things too because I love what you said there's nobody more lost than Paul there's also nobody more religious than than Saul at the time um, this was a man who was zealous for the scripture. This was a man who was zealous for uh, the law and keeping it. Um, we find out by his own testimony, it's interesting as we wind around there, he says by his own testimony, he just had this one hang up with the law and it was covetousness of all things. But yeah, there was nobody more lost, but there's also nobody more religious because religion cannot save you. Only Jesus can save you. And so this whole conversion of Saul is pushing things in a Gentile direction, which is why in that same reading, you've got Peter who's having this vision of all of these things coming down and they're supposedly unclean. And the voice is saying, rise, Peter, kill me. He's like, no way. I'm not going to be unclean. I want to honor God. And, and God's saying, listen, it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean. It's always been the heart. I've just given you this one as your teacher so that you will know that you need a savior. And two, I've given it to you for your benefit and your protection. And three, for a witness to others that they may know what people who follow me, what life is like for them. And so you have this, this, this movement that's happening in this encounter. I'm with you, Ward. I mean, I don't know how you go from, Hey, I had my breakfast at, at 9 AM and I'm headed to go drag men, women, children out of synagogues, put them in wagons, haul them back, public spectacles, prison, whatever. And suddenly this blinding light and, and I'm blind and I'm praying and I'm fasting and I'm going through all this and I have a vision and there's this guy who comes and he lays his hands on me, the scales fall off. Now I can see. So I need to be baptized for this repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. And then you know what? Let's go over to the synagogue. People need to hear this good news. I'm going to proclaim um, what God has done. So let, let's talk, um, jump on any of those details you want to. And let's talk a little bit about uh, um, faith and obedience in that relationship as well. Yeah, there's a lot of symbolism in his in the scales falling off his eyes, right? That, that's essentially cataract. So this is the first instance of LASIK surgery going on a long time before it was invented, where God says, I'm going to take this off of your eyes so you can see what's he doing. He's saying, uh, you've, got, you, you've been completely blinded to the truth for this nonsense that people say, well, as long as you're sincere in your faith, you'll be fine. No. The more devout you are, the more wrong you are if what you are more devout in is wrong. And it's harder to win somebody who is a devout whatever <laughs> than somebody who's a nominal whatever. And so what you have here is, is you know, God saying, I, I want you and I'm going to come get you and you're going to come uh, work for me in essence. <clears throat> and Saul, Paul has to show faith by saying, all right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate my faith by doing what you've asked me to do. And that's the case for all of us, isn't it? It's not that by doing these things we gain faith. It's that 
the proof that we have faith is that we do things. And this is not so much a way to judge others, though, though it's, it's a way to judge ourselves, to say, listen, uh, you know, do I have this faith that I say? Well, that's a very simple answer. The answer to that is, are you doing anything? Are you a follower of Jesus? Not have you prayed a prayer or not have you walked an aisle, raised a hand, or threw a stick in the fire at camp? No, it's am I a follower of Jesus? That's the question, and that should be what we ask ourselves. Yeah, and I think, too, you know, as you see, um, I, you know, when Ananias gets there, he calls him Brother Saul, and and, and, and you see this this obedience that, that happens in his life. You know, we are saved by grace through faith alone, but it's a faith that doesn't stay alone. Jesus said, I'll know that you love me by the way that you obey me. Obedience is linked um, because the fruit of righteousness has to be borne out in our lives or we're not in the vine. We're, we're not a part of the kingdom. And so it's not, okay, uh, this legalistic pursuit where I keep all these rules and I do all these things so that I can gain God's favor and earn my way into heaven. That's not it at all. The evidence of grace in your life that you have had an encounter and it's changed you forever is, man, Saul, as soon as the scales come off, he's like, all right, I've repented of my sin. I've trusted Jesus Christ for salvation. I want to be baptized. And now let's head on over to the synagogue. I'm going to go start telling the truth. And incidentally, he was under threat of losing his life before he ever got out of, out of Damascus. And so there's this movement that's so important for us to see where the Gentiles are coming into view. And what's happening with Peter and what's happening with Paul, this, this apologetic for those who follow Christ is on display in the church because there was nowhere else in this land that you would go in and you would find Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, you know, the, the whole thing, the apologetic was the fact that, man, the, these, guys, these guys are all together in one place and that doesn't happen anywhere else. So the evidence of grace is right there. Yeah, you know, the cautionary thing to me in all this is that we don't have the idea that, uh, oh man, if I don't have the fruit, as you say, or if I'm, if I'm not seeing it right away, I'm questioning my salvation or anything like that. Um, we have to remember that Paul himself writes that he who began a good work in you is the one that will complete it in the, in that day in the day of Jesus. And so we have to remember that this is, this fruit is a process and we're all going to fall and fail, but that doesn't mean that we're not in the vine per se. It's just, we need to be able to see a pattern. Are you going to war against the flesh and sin? Are you fighting the good fight? Are you doing the things that would indicate that you really do, you know, trust and love God? That's the thing. Yeah, because we, we still sin. Even when we're in Christ, we, we, we still sin. And, and the key word that you just said there is this ongoing pattern. It's not, do you fail? Because if that's the criteria, I mean, we've blown it out. We can't even count how many times we messed it up today. But it is the fact that there is an ongoing pattern, the evidence of grace um, in my life, because God has taken a heart that was stoned. He's turned into a heart of flesh, and there's a new set of desires at work within me. As a matter of fact, you know, in the same vein, um, you see that Peter, since we've been talking about Peter, I mean, here's Peter who is, he's failed spectacularly many times, but now he's doing all this brilliant stuff. Well, he's going to turn around and struggle. He's the one who got the vision of the sheet coming down and, hey, rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, 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 no. And then he gets it. And then he's sent to this man, Cornelius, who whose house is there. And um, he, he fears God. And then suddenly you see the Holy Spirit come on them. And so, Peter's had a divine revelation that, hey, salvation is for the Gentiles. But even Peter struggles in that with his obedience. And in Galatians, I just, I, I can tell you right now, just reading the way that Paul and Peter were, can you imagine what the clash must have been like? Because basically, Peter was hanging out with the Gentiles. Everything's fine until some people from Jerusalem showed up some Jewish leaders. And when the, the people from the church of Jerusalem show up, Peter stops eating with the Gentiles. 
<laughs> and I love the way that Paul says, I imposed him to his face. I have a tendency to think that it was probably loud, spectacular, and quite public. But here's Peter, the spokesperson who we started with, with the brilliant sermon and healings and stuff. And here he is failing in loving his brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, you talk about a pattern. Okay, so here's the guy who's continually screwing up, and yet he's continually fighting the good fight. He's continually making war against the flesh. And it's great that God gives us as him as the quintessential example of, of God using screw-ups because he continually gets back on the horse as often as he falls off, and as a result, he even is used to pen Holy Scripture, which we can read today. I mean, the Gospel of Mark is essentially his story as well. So it's just it's just a wonderful thought that God could use somebody like Peter, i.e. me. Yeah, and the trajectory of his life, um, we Peter finished well, willing to die for the cause. Um, uh, didn't even count himself worthy to die in the same way that his king did. And so... Um, the stories go that he was crucified upside down. And so it's just this incredible thing. A true encounter with God changes, changes you. Um, somebody asked Martin Lloyd Jones one time, um, what is somebody who's encountered God look like? And referencing back to Jacob, he said they walk with a limp. And so there's this, there's this mark that happens on us and it's not necessarily some sort of physical thing you see on the outside, but we just know because the spirit bears witness with us, there's this fruit that begins to happen. And it's really in spite of us because of the work of Christ in our lives and his sanctifying power of the Holy spirit as we're washed, made clean and follow him. So uh, exciting times indeed. I hope you guys are enjoying. We got a, a, another week we're going to spend in acts and we'll discuss that uh, next week. Uh, same time, same channel for week 29. Until then, Ward, thanks as always for joining me, sir. We bid you good evening there in, uh, well, it's not sunny, but it's very lovely there in Orlando, I'm told. And Bob, um, you backslidden NASA, former NASA employee, you better get your stuff together and get back here. We, I don't know what we'll do, but we'll come up with something. So till then, everybody, keep reading. Everybody needs one more verse.